Hello, Year 11. I hope you're all well. That was quite a rush to get home, I can tell you. I've only just got home about five minutes ago. I hope you are all fine. Please say hello in the comments. Do introduce yourself so I can welcome you to the stream. And uh, we will crack on and get on with some more stuff. Let me, first of all, stick this on here like so. And the question is, while we're getting warmed up, how many memory registers can you name? I'm hoping it's a couple. How many do you reckon you can name? Uh, do do introduce yourself. If you don't, it's fine. But it's always nicer when I can welcome you. How many memory registers can you name? Stick it in. Uh, QPR isn't one. AFC isn't one. Uh, HWS isn't one. Any ideas about what any of these memory registers are called? Any ideas at all? Do let me know. How many can you name? Give it a go. And while you're while you're busily typing in, or not, as the case may be, there's four people there. We've now got four people. Um, I will I will push on. Everyone's being quite shy, so let's go on. I'll go to the next one and see, uh, and see. No, no one's done it. You're all you're all being quiet. Okay, fine. So this is what we've got. What about this one? One of them stores the address where data is read. One of them stores the data fetched from memory. Uh, one of them stores the results of the calculation. And one of them stores the address of the next instruction to be run. I've got a whole like as well. I'm doing very well here. Any ideas? Any ideas? Oh, we've got a few. All right. Tell you what, I'll go to the next one. How's that? So we've got this. So these are the four that you need to learn. And I think what's nice and easy is that if you look at the, uh, let's have a look. If we look at this guy here, the MAR, the memory address register, we've got the memory data register, we've got the accumulator that works with the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, and we've got the program counter that points to the next instruction. So do try for next week to try and get as many of those learned as you possibly can. All right. So, um, well, not much in the way of questions being answered, which isn't a terrible thing because there's actually quite a lot of stuff to do today. So I'll tell you what, let's get on with that stuff. Now, you have had some of these questions in your previous uh, assessment. So this will hopefully be of some use to you. Types of networks. I'm going to try to cram about four weeks worth of teaching into about 35 minutes. So let's see how we do. Um, so first of all, types of network. Very early on in the paper, they're going to they're gonna ask you about LANs and WANs, and we'll get to that in a second. But also, what is a computer network, which is the first logical question? Well, a, lot, a computer network is when you join together two or more computers. And they might say, they might ask you, what's the advantage of uh, using a network? Well, the word share, which is here, sharing information, but you can say, it's for sharing files. It's for sharing an internet connection. It's for sharing um, devices. So there's three possible marks for you just using the word share. The roaming profiles and communication, I'd actually ignore that because I stole this from, uh, from somewhere else, so I'd ignore that. That's not that useful, and it's also not part of your spec. But over here on the, on the left-hand side, this and this, these are the two. Share, share, share. So talk about sharing and then say internet connection. Ah, warrant. Hello, dear man. We meet again. Well done for being here. What a good chap you are. Um, good to see you. I hope all is well. Um, big topic, this. It's a huge topic. And it, 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 it sort of, I think it's probably the largest unit they've got inside this uh, J277. Right. So the starter is, what's a network? Well, what's it good for? It's good for sharing. Okay. Problems with networks are, is that when you use one, and this is hardly <laughs> this is hardly a difficult point, is that when you use one, you are reliant on network resources. In other words, if the network resources go down, if the server doesn't work, you've got nothing. Okay, so rather than using a standalone computer, which is fairly reliable, I mean, so are servers. But if your server goes down, we've got six in. Do say hello. Um, it just means that that you're reliant on it. Okay, so that's one thing. Next thing is the hardware is costly. Servers cost thousands and th I mean tens and twenties and thirties and hundreds of thousands of pounds. Uh, there's a risk of uh, viruses and being hacked. And also the last one, in case they go for a big mark question on this, you need people who know what they're doing. 
in other words, specialized staff. So you've got to pay for specialist staff and they tend to be more expensive. All right. So that's that's just sort of opening gambit there of what a computer network is and what the benefits and disadvantages of a network are. Let's jump into lands and wans. This was on your last assessment. I think most of you got it right. The important thing here is that you don't just say a LAN is a local area network. And I know that's the very first thing that it says. And a LAN is a local area network, but you don't get your mark for just saying what LAN stands for. You actually need, as an opener, as an opener I would say, stick with this. It's a small geographical area. If they want more than that, and they're giving you a couple or four marks for it, it's usually a two-mark question. You could talk about the ownership. The hardware for a LAN is usually owned by the individual organisation. Whereas the a WAN down here, a wide area network, is over. It connects LANs in different geographical locations. Or easier still, you can just say it covers a large geographical area. For some reason, this question, people tend to write quite bizarre sentences, like it covers a large geography, large geography, someone wrote in the assessment. Large geography? What, what does that even mean? So, so, so when you write something down, you might, you, it might make sense inside your head, but do actually look at what you write and think, is that, is that a human language or am I just writing nonsense? Because exams are stressful situations and they bring out the worst in us. Ah, Sir Gabriel, welcome, sir. Um, I'm really pleased you're here. We've got uh, got 10 in so far. This is excellent. Lands and wands, easy peasy. Two mark question at the start, probably. So that is uh, what you need to say. Um, it's more expensive. We've got other things there, but it's usually a two mark question. So stick to large and small geographical area. And then if they want more, talk about ownership. In terms of the wide area network, and obviously the internet is an example of a wide area network because it's a network of networks, okay? The infrastructure is usually leased for a wide area network. The, you know, so, for example, Hazelwick doesn't own the internet, clearly. Um, but it does own the devices that are there, <laughs> apart from the ones that it leases, which are the ones you use, actually, because that's the model that they use. But generally speaking, stick to those. All right, next thing. Um, and that's the easy peasy stuff, really, isn't it? Network performance. You had a question on this in the mock. And this is this list of six things. Sorry, I can't count five things that you need to learn. What impacts network performance? Um, bandwidth, sharing bandwidth, uh, transmission media, error rate and latency. And don't forget, in the question you did, we've got nine people in. Do say hello. Um, I am glad Sir Gabriel's here. Good man. Um, they did something quite nasty to you in the, in that uh, in that particular question. They used the word how, and you had to say how it impacted. So it involved thinking a little bit beyond the question. Unfortunately, you can't always rely on just repeating what they say here. They might give you a context. So you've got to slightly adapt your question. Um, but bandwidth, we know, is the uh, the maximum rate of data transfer. Sharing bandwidth. This was this was one that people answered really badly. Um, but it's the fact that multiple users sharing the bandwidth means that there's less bandwidth to go around. So therefore, there you know there'll be more traffic. Therefore, it'll slow down. Transmission media. A few of you mentioned that. Error rate: the number of errors encountered in a given time when there are data collisions, for example, and data's lost. Um, and then you've got latency and what you gamers would call lag, which is the time taken for data to pass from one point to another. This one crops up with 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 regularity so i would i would find some kind of mnemonic of learning that b s t e uh i haven't thought of one so maybe you should and go away do you remember that um crayon speaking polish during role play the people that i teach that's what we did for that's what we did for the um for media and thinking about uh hard drives uh, i'll get there in a second thinking about different storage devices and the qualities of a storage device that's not the word but but describing it portability um uh, durability all that sort of stuff <laughs> i've forgotten the word again that I, I i forgot earlier so those those are the five things you need to learn for this one and by the way any questions that don't make sense because i am going at breakneck speed just stick it in the uh in the comments won't belts work? Wouldn't belts work? Oh, belts would work. Belts is good. Wow, that is excellent. You should, you should, you're doing a better job than me. Belts, yeah, belts is perfect. Let's go back one. That's what I meant to do there. 
Let's go belts. I think belts is perfect. Uh, even better still, if you stick a picture of a belt in your mind, like around a computer, something weird like that, and that might work. B-E-L-T-S. Nice. Very good. Um, you should get a. Uh, you should get an especially lovely cell. <laughs> Maybe an evil laugh is more appropriate. Actually, something nicer than that. Uh, ooh, there we go. That's more appropriate. Outstanding. What a good man you are, Warrant. All right. So yeah, that's good. Belts. Belts. I shall be using that in my teaching. I'm not paying you any money for it though. Just bear that in mind. Okay. This one we've got seven people in. Do say hello again if things aren't making sense. Uh, uh, hello, Madcap. How are you? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, right, peer-to-peer uh, -peer and client-server. Again, this is money for old rope marks. We've got eight in. Do say hello in the comments. So let's have a look at these guys and think about we've now got more in. This is good. So first of all, peer-to-peer. Peer-to-peer is when you simply would plug one computer plug. As such, you would link two computers with, with, with a cable. And we'll look into what that means in the next uh, on, on, on the next screen. And then you've got the client server where you've got the boss, which is the client, and you've got the server, which is the sort of Dumbo that does what it's told, okay? Um, although Dumbo the elephant was quite smart, but let's not get into that. So those are the two, the two, uh, the two different types of networks they expect you to understand. We've got topologies, which we come to later, but the two types of network are peer-to-peer -peer and client server. So client server, sorry, peer to peer, they could do a couple of marks asking you to define the difference between them, or they could even do an advantages, disadvantages type question. So in a peer to peer, all devices are equal. Uh, they connect to each other. The files, though, are stored on the individual device and then shared with other devices. So it's a bit clunky. So you might want something that's stored in different computers. So you've got to then you've got to then navigate to their hard drive through your computer and get their resources. Um, and really, I mean, this isn't used in a in a business sense. If you've got this is usually used. I mean, I'm sure at home you've got your computers connected to the printer. So remember we talked about sharing resources. So all of your computers might connect to the printer really people don't connect computers to each other because it's it's a faff and it's much easier to actually do it do it properly but in a really small office with one or two people or three people it, it might it might it might not warrant spending out money on a on a server because servers are expensive so maybe when you're starting up a company this might be where you go or for a one or two person uh, band uh, company peer-to-peer -peer. so it's easy to maintain it's simple uh, you don't require technical expertise therefore it's not expensive to do the hardware is not expensive you're just plugging one thing you're just uh, connecting one thing with another and it's not dependent on the server so you can go to the server and that way you can say this one needs a server and the problem with that is that if the server goes down you've got nothing but the problem with peer-to-peer -peer, and think about your network at school is there's no centralized management so any updates, so say, for example, you've got five computers that are connected together and you want to update a piece of software that runs on all of them, you've got to go to all five computers, take out your CD or your download and then update them. And it's an absolute pain in the neck. I mean, it takes me back to when I first started teaching. <laughs> there was this poor woman whose job it was to go around the uh, the 50 machines in the school with her Windows, uh, with her Windows CD and then just put Windows onto all of them and to spend all day clicking next 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 which is very tedious um, so the cons are backups is a pain it is complicated to do with so many computers then also it gets really confusing because you've got lots of copies of files duplicates potentially on several computers which is the most up-to-date one and you're just wasting storage and having duplicates um, and there we go a couple of others there is that peer-to-peer -peer, it, it's all right for one or two computers but generally it's not something you would do Client server, a bit more complicated. And in terms of what happens, the network is managed by the server. And the server is a powerful, dedicated computer. The word dedicated means that it does one job only. Okay. Now, actually, you can use virtualization to make it do several. But for example, it could be a print server, or it could be a web server, or it could be a file server. So when you open something that you saved at school, like a Word document or a PowerPoint document, that is stored on the file server. But it's not stored on the file server itself. It's stored on server-attached storage. So 
SSDs that are linked, that are connected to the server. And the server does all the heavy lifting. So it, it finds your file on the hard drive, the server, and it serves it up to you, literally, okay? So the way this works is that uh, and central storage, that's one of the massive advantages. You're storing everything in one place. And the way it works is that the client, i.e. you sat at school, asks, uh, sends a request, which means you double click on a Word document and expect it to open. That's sending a request. The server in the server room processes the request and then gives you the file that you asked for. And it can store things like user profiles, passwords, which is what happens at school, okay? Also, as happens at school, it's set up with different levels of access. So I can access things that you can't, and my line manager can access things that I can't. So that's a way of keeping data secure. And web servers, by the way, for web pages, work in the same way. So you've got an HTML document, which is the web page itself. And I'm sure you've right-clicked and do view source at some point. And you see all the HTML code where it'll tell you what the background color is, where the images are, where the text is. And it's literally a list of where to put things on a page. And the server looks at that information on the, um, on the HTML document and just serves it up to you. Because the HTML document says, this image is here. This image, should, this image is stored here, it needs to be in this place. This text is stored here, it should be in this place. That's just how it works. So that is a client-server network. And I'm going to stop saying this, but this that they will ask you about a client-server network. So just make sure you've got a couple of things that you, can, that you can say about defining it and a couple of advantages and disadvantages that you can use to riff off client-server versus peer-to-peer. So here are the advantages and disadvantages. The good things are that you can keep track of centrally stored files. If you think about it, you only need to learn this once. Om, dear man. Hello, I hadn't seen you there. How are you? Thank you for being here. Great to see you. 14 people in, which is outstanding. Um, yeah, easy to keep track of files, performing backups, installing and updating software. So, for example, if they want to update Windows, they simply click on update and it updates it across them across all the computers say for example they wanted to move they wanted to to, to do the you know in the uh, music department they've got specialists they've got cubase they've got software for for writing songs what's the word composing that's the word for composing songs so if they wanted to move all of that software to a different part of the school it's literally a couple of clicks of the button and then it just gets sent across there so that's why managing it is so much easier with client server um, but here's the problem. The servers are expensive and you have to have someone who knows what they're doing. If they put me in charge of the servers, not a great deal would happen because I've never I've never run servers. So, I mean, I, I, you, you'd click buttons, but people might never log on again. So you do need to know what you're doing. And people who have been trained in how to run a server are going to cost you money. So you'll be spending you know, 40 grand to have someone who's a server manager because because they need to have had the proper training, the Microsoft training, usually the Cisco training to to, uh, to to run a server. Also, you've got this notion that we had before. It's a single point of failure. If the server goes down, you ain't got nothing. And that's the problem with it, which you don't have with peer-to-peer. -peer. And also the servers can become overloaded. So there you go. Enough there to riff off the pros and the cons of client-server versus peer to peer peer. I'm going very quickly. Network hardware is the next thing we need to think about. You need to know one, two, three, four, five. I think there's five there. WAPs, routers, switches, NICs and transmission media. So I'm going to run through these at like a racehorse. It's about the only way I'm like a racehorse, but we're going to run through these really quickly to see just to make sure that you can describe each of these. I'm going to linger a bit on routers because OCR love a router question. And we've had six and we've had six mark questions on routers in this syllabus and in the IT syllabus, they've done a 10 mark question on a router, which was people running out of things to say. But router is, it's not fair to say the most important thing, but it is, it is the device that probably does the most heavy lifting in a network, all right? So routers, really important. You spend a bit of time to actually understand what a router does. That's what the spec says. Be precise. So here we go. Wireless access point or a WAP. Uh, it can be, um, uh, it's usually a box that looks like this, right? And just to make a change, it's a white box. It's usually a black box with IT. What does it do? First of all, it allows a wireless capable device 
to connect to a wired network. Let's just unpack that slightly. So for example, you've got a phone, you have, uh, you want to access uh, some, some resources, and someone has plugged their resources into a wireless access point. So you can connect to a network through a wireless access point. Uh, it's a hardware device, and the connections are made through wireless standards, e.g. Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, usually Wi-Fi. Okay, it's also known as a hotspot. I want to spend. We got we got we got fifteen people in. I want to spend just two minutes talking about the difference between Wi-Fi and the internet. The Wi-Fi is is a bit like a train, and the internet are the passengers. So the Wi-Fi carries the internet signal, and we, because we're lazy and we don't really care, we tend to say, "Oh, is there Wi-Fi?" But what we actually mean is, is there Wi-Fi with an internet connection? Because you can have Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi by itself just means you can connect to something. But if you haven't got an internet feed as well, you haven't got the internet. So the two are different. Um, and it's just worth making that uh, distinction between the two. Where are we? 20 minutes in. All right, the router. Big build up here. The bad news is, oh, uh, oh Marco, what about the www? I didn't see that. What do you mean? Tell me, what do you mean? What about the www? What about the WMW? I don't know. Uh, give me a bit of clarity, Marco. I know it'll be a sensible question because you're a sensible chap, but I don't know what you mean. In relation to... Oh, in, in relation to... Yeah, okay, I do know what you mean. Let's go back to here. That's actually a really good question. <laughs> yeah, the internet versus the World Wide Web. I do... I'm talking about the internet feed. You're actually correct, Marco, because we've, we, we've said before that you've got the You've got the internet and you've got the World Wide Web. And actually, they're both different. The internet is the, is, the, is, the, is the infrastructure and the World Wide Web is what you do on it. So again, I use the analogy of a train and passengers. So that's pretty much works the same way. So when I say an internet connection, I mean a connection to the World Wide Web using the internet. So the World Wide Web is what you do. Yeah, no, absolutely spot on. So, so, so that's what I'm doing now. You're, you're absolutely right. So, I've been lazy and used the two. I mean that you're able to access the internet and the World Wide Web because you have to. So, the the internet, yeah. So it's like saying you've got to go onto a platform to get on a train, and the platform is going to be the internet, and the World Wide Web is the train that will take you there. I've got to stop using transport as the example, but the World Wide Web and the internet the infrastructure and what you do on it. Okay, so the World Wide Web is what is what you do on it. And that was the bit invented by Tim Berners-Lee, um, British scientist who worked in CERN. Um, so the, 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 the internet is, is web pages, is HTTP, is HTML, is all the pop stuff. All of that is related to the internet, whereas the World Wide, well, sorry, all that is related to the World Wide Web, whereas the internet is all the routers and switches and cables and all that sort of stuff. Marco, have I made sense or have I waffled terribly? Tell me. But I'm saying connection to the internet and the World Wide Web for the WAP, okay? I hope that makes sense. Okay, receiving packets, routers. Routers do a lot of heavy lifting. Think about the router like a postman. 13 people in, outstanding. The router receives packets. We know you had a naughty question in your assessment because packet switching isn't actually in this specification, but do you know what? Ah, oh, good. Thank you, Marco. I'm sure you're being kind and I was waffling, but do ask me if that doesn't make sense. But 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 I hope it does. One's the infrastructure and one's what you do on it, okay? So, uh, yeah. All right. The router is the postman. The router is the post person that is going to send data from your computer to wherever you want to send it and is going to bring the data that you want to receive back onto your computer. It's a very primary school way of saying that. But actually, once you understand the notion that it is the device that actually sends and receives all of your data, then going into the details is a bit, is a bit less difficult. So for one mark, it receives data packets, and we know that data is sent in packets. It takes those packets and it forwards the packets within your network. It also transmits packets to a different network. Let's unpick that. Your network at home is a local area network like I'm working on here. I've got a few computers. They're not, they're not wired together, but I'm connected to a printer. So it's my little mini network here. So if I want to send things to my printer, I'm, I'm, using, I'm, I'm transmitting packets, okay? What it also does 
is it reads the final destination, so where your packets are being sent. And that's obvious when you think about it. We'll talk about IP addresses and so on in a minute, okay? So if you're going to send something somewhere, you're sending it to an address, the address of a device. And that device will then receive, and you also have an IP address for your uh, for your computer when you're on the internet, and that will receive and uh, and 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 send out um, data packets. So it also identifies the most efficient path. Right. So me, you are watching this feed uh, at home, and uh, the data is being sent from me uh, through my router to another router to another router to another router and then it's getting to you in Crawley and I'm sat here in Brighton I think it goes through about two or three routers okay but if it turns out that one router is encountering a lot of traffic or one router goes down it'll route it'll route those um, data packets elsewhere the router also assigns the address to nodes or devices a node is just a way of saying any device on a network and it converts packets from one protocol to another. Now, you don't need to know all of these, but I would really recommend that you actually make sure you know three or four, because I fancy they'll do a router question. I know I'm being like Mystic Meg here, but I fancy they'll do a question on routers. Um, and I'm just, just for the sake of being detailed, because it's interesting, when in your network at home, they're not called packets, they're called frames. And they're just formulated slightly differently. So a router can understand and move frames and it can understand and move packets. So here, I'm using frames, and when I'm sending it out to you, the router converts them to packets so that you, so that your device is able to understand them, to make sense of them, okay? For want of a better route, uh, for want of a better word. A wireless router is the same, but it's wireless. You might want to consider, uh, if they ask a question, the advantage of a wireless router is that you don't need to alter the fabric of the building. However, it's got slower data transmission speeds, OK? And very often the boxes we've got with lots of flashing lights at home is a router and a modem and various other things combined as well, OK? And a WAP, uh, a wireless access point. So all of those things are, are, are sort of condensed into one box that BT or Virgin sell you, OK? as part of your subscription. Then we've got a switch, not so much here, a switch and it looks a bit like that. And in the computer science rooms where you work at school, the switch is that we've got, you've got gigantic ones of these mounted high up on the wall so you can't stick your fingers in them. And they've got about 30, they've got 30 of these ports here. Yep, they've got 30 of these ports and it flashes and actually they're quite noisy. They, they emit a really loud hum. Um, and what do they do? They form a connection between ports and devices, all right? And it makes full use of bandwidth, therefore no data collisions. Make sure you know two of those for the exam so that you can actually define it. You're not going to have to do much more than that when it comes to a switch. All right, next, a NIC, a network interface card. A network interface card connects computers to network. And you've seen these. These are, if you've taken a computer apart, these are uh, pressed, these little connections over here are pressed into your motherboard. There's a slot there for it. You push it in and uh, that's your network interface card. This here is your port just there where you can put in your ethernet cable. And there'll also be a wireless connection here. So you've got a wired and a wireless connection. It uses the ethernet protocol, which is for your local area network in school. These, uh, these, you've seen these because half of you have unplugged them from your computers at some time or another. But you come across these and they've got a little tab there that you click in and you've got to push the tab in to get it out again. So they are usually integrated into the motherboard. I'm going quickly. Transmission media, 14 people in. Do say hello. Yes, that makes sense. Good, I've answered your questions. Right, so let's have a look at transmission e media. This, just so you know, is the cable I was talking about a few minutes ago. This is your CAT cable. It's used as an, eth it's an Ethernet cable. It is used with the Ethernet protocol. And the Ethernet protocol is a set of rules for how the Ethernet, for how data is, uh, is transmitted and how data is formed is the wrong word. How data is put together. It'll come back to me. How, how data is formulated. Okay, so that's your Ethernet cable. Then we've got this one, the wired uh, copper, uh, copper cable, the Ethernet cable. It's fast, it's reliable, it's not much interference, it's thin and flexible, it's easy to install, and it's cheap. 
uh, and say, uh, rather than saying cheap, just say it, it's inexpensive compared to something else, all right? So that's why schools are full of copper cable, because it's in it's the cheapest way of moving data around, and it's pretty quick as well. The way it works, inside your Ethernet cable, you've got four sets of unshielded twisted pairs. This is a pair of cables. They're twisted together, um, they're unshielded, and... Um, it's four sets of copper wires. And what they and the reason that they're wound round each other is because two cables wound round each other means less interference. Okay? And that's why it's done that way. Bon, let's push on. Where are we? Half past. Okay, we've covered quite a lot. Fiber optic cable, let's talk about the Gucci. So we've covered copper cable. Copper cable is the cheap and cheerful way of uh, moving data from one place. <laughs> Pardon me, from one place to another. Fiber optic is the Hugo Boss, it's the Gucci, it's the Armani of uh, of cabling. It's a bit like this. At the core, you have this guy here. That's at the core of it. But let's have a look at a bit more a bit more detail about this. Fiber optic cable, it's fabulous for sending data for gigantically long distances. It's high performance. It's it's really high performance. And that's why if if you've got a broadband connection, Virgin and BT. Everyone expects to have fiber optic cable now. Fiber is faster than copper. So that's why you pay a premium for uh, for using fiber. What's the good thing about it? Oh, by the way, fiber means that light, um, that the data is transmitted uh, using pulses of light. Light is fast. It travels at 186,000 miles per second. So light is literally the fastest way that you can uh, that you can send anything because Einstein predicted there was nothing quicker. Light speed, that's it. The good thing uh, about fiber optic is that there's no data loss because it's so reflective inside. And also you can lay fiber optic cables in the most disgusting conditions. So, for example, under the English Channel, um, going between us uh, and the States, uh, you know, across the Atlantic, it's fiber they lay there because fiber doesn't rot. It doesn't rust like copper cable. Um, problem is it's expensive. And it's not as malleable. It's 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 not as bendy. Malleable means so it's actually trying to lay it in a room. You going round corners is quite hard, whereas copper cable is quite forgiving. It's really easy to lay down. Okay, so it's it's a bit less flexible, not as malleable. So those are the advantages, and it's expensive. It's it's the most expensive way. We are on to the internet for people in. Sorry, fourteen people in the internet. They want you to determine, yes, that is a good question. Yes, Marco, it is exactly that. It's about pulses of light. And, I mean, if you think about it, it's the same as electricity. They'll be looking at how much light's being sent, and it's and it's one for and it's one for light and zero for no, in the same as, you know, electricity present, yes, electricity not present, no. The good thing is they won't ask you that. Um, and we're getting more into engineering there, but uh, that is exactly how it works. Okay? Bon. Right, the internet is, for one mark, a network of networks and information, as Marco very, uh, very, as, as Marco asked me to explain to you, information is shared via the World Wide Web, but the internet itself is a network of networks. So the internet is the infrastructure, it's all the switches and the cables and the routers, and the World Wide Web is what you do on it, okay? Now, the World Wide Web is based around the TCP IP protocol invented by Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s. Um, and it's a set of rules that, how, that governs how data is formatted. I knew I'd get there, how data is formatted. That's the right word. Um, and how data is sent. So packet switching, which we have covered, is exactly what TCP IP is. And it's about two protocols doing each doing a similar type of job and then handing over to each other. So one protocol chops the data up into packets, the other one then routes it, it then hands back to the previous one that then puts the data back together again and checks to make sure what was sent was there. So that's how TCP IP works. And Bob and Vint in the 60s wrote this um, wrote this protocol, this set of rules for how data for how data is formulated. Um, formatted, sorry, and, and how it's transmitted, because that's what this, the protocols we're studying are. Um, and that is the internet, really, and everything's based around TCP IP. That, that, if you take away that, you, you have got no internet at all. Obvious things that you know, websites are hosted on web servers. I 
told you about that one earlier, and you access it through the HTTP protocol. Look how this word has appeared twice on this particular screen. Protocol, protocol. Because the hypertext transfer protocol is again about web pages. All right. And then the last thing on here is just a bit of information, which I'm sure you know, is that when you type in the address, so you've got an address, youtube.com forward slash whatever it is, whatever address you've got in your address um, bar, that is called a URL, a uniform resource locator. So that's what it's called. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, I've just realized this diagram is next to useless, but, it, but it's quite pretty. There you go. <laughs> Uh, where are we? 35, 10 minutes left. I'll do some quizzing in a second. Good. We've got to this one. Uh, 15 people in. Do say hello. Uh, DNS. They love a DNS question. And they, in the past, for for subjects like uh, the domain name server or system, um, they they take a piece of text that describes how DNS, DNS works, and then they create a close exercise, you know, a fill-in-the-gaps exercise. So that's quite likely. So therefore, the best way to prepare for this is just to make sure you're happy with the story of how DNS works. I'll run through the story. I think this is quite tricky to understand, but there's, there, there are a couple of areas you need to understand, first of all. So DNS, let's start there. DNS stands for Domain Name System or Domain Name Server, but they're, they're not similar, but, they, but it's all part of the same sort of um, area, if you like. So let's start here. A Domain Name System which is the overarching, uh, the overarching sort of area we're looking at. It's the phone book of the internet. So this is how the addressing system works. So when you send data, it's DNS. This is all to do with the domain name system to make sure it gets to the right place. So let's jump in. There is such a thing which is a domain name server. And we know that a server is a powerful computer which stores information. Oh, another question from Marco. Is there a difference between a web browser and a search engine? Yes. A search engine runs independently of a web browser. So a web browser allows you to uh, to simply type in a, a... allows you. So a web browser would allow you... OK, I can answer this question. A search engine sits on top of the web browser. That's the first thing. So the web browser is the application that you're using to access the World Wide Web, which is on the internet, and the search engine would then sit on top of that and would give you the functionality of being able to find um, uh, to find uh, websites. And of course, I mean, Google's the best known example, and Google has bots that trawl the web looking to see where things are. And so it's a kind of, it's a directory that sits on top of it. So it's almost like a virtual directory. And the way that it, the way that Google, um, go and search for new websites is actually quite extraordinary. Um, I hope that makes sense. All right, domain name server is a database of domain names and IP addresses. The first important thing is that DNS holds this information. Right, here's the important thing. You might type in nike.com, and I'm saying Nike because that's what the owner calls it, so don't complain. Nike.com, right? You'll go, it's Nike, nike.com. Now, the actual IP address of nike.com is 192.158.1.38. You're asking, but why don't we just use the number? Isn't that easier? Well, no. I've been married for 35 years. I still don't know my wife's phone number. So that's why this system has been developed. So in other words, Nike.com is what you humans type in, just here, right? But underneath that is this number. And the DNS has a table, if you like. It's got a table of all the domain names and the IP addresses they link to. Because if we were reliant on typing in that many digits to get to, to use the internet, it would make it unusable. Because you'd literally need a list of, 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 of sort of a translation between the two next to you. You'd, you'd need to look up a table yourself. So they're taking that work out for you. They're taking, they're taking that work away. If you think about it, how would a computer know what Nike.com is? They wouldn't. It's got to be turned into a number, hasn't it? And of course, this will be turned into, you know what sort of number, because everything goes to binary. So we use domain names. An example of a domain name is Nike.com. And you're saying to me, is it a URL? What is it? 
Nike.com is a domain name because it's the top level domain. But underneath Nike.com, you've got forward slash trainers, forward slash weightlifting gear. Do you know what I mean? So, so the, it, it's the top level at which things are stored. BBC.co.uk, it's a domain name. And then everything with the forward slash is stored underneath there in a series of folders, okay? So web browsers interact through the internet protocol. So almost answering your question there, Marco. So web browsers like you're using now to watch YouTube, they use the IP protocol. Remember we talked about TCP IP a bit earlier on? So DNS converts the name names. In other words, the DNS, the, the domain name server, converts nike.com into 192.158.1.38 and this means that you can access internet resources using your browser which is an application okay um, these have to be updated regularly you don't really need to know that but it's interesting um, now there are m the m domain name service which we said sits at the very top of this sorry the domain name service or domain name system has got multiple domain name servers I'm going to sneeze no I'm not um, I am blimey okay so if a domain name if it, so for example if you were looking for a a domain name that is in India, it might be that your local domain name server doesn't have that because no one's ever asked for it, it doesn't need it. But your domain name server will look at that web address and go, well, that looks like an Indian one to me, so I'll, I'll send this over to the domain name server in Mumbai. And then that will look at it and go, well, actually, this looks like it's something in Madras. So it'll then, it'll then bounce off the next one. So it's a really clever system and it's spread out across the entire world, okay? Uh, and that's a domain name service. So they like a bit of a fill in the gaps exercise to do that one. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> hosting. Um, this is now uh, thinking about, about hosting. A website has to be hosted. So uh, whether you're looking at YouTube, whether you're looking at uh, bbc.co.uk or nike.com indeed, that information has to, be ho has to be held somewhere, hosting, okay? And so what tends to happen is that a business will set itself up and will store people's files. And that's essentially what, what the internet is, is people storing people's files. And your files can be held. So if you've, I've got an iCloud account because I'm with Apple, and all of my files are stored in some gigantic server farm somewhere in California or wherever electricity is cheap. Um, and that's where I access them from. And then there are file servers and application servers which do all the heavy lifting. So if I want to download something from a web server and I click on it, the file server downloads that for me. All right. Websites are hosted on a web server and websites have a domain name which you just covered and uh, that should be a, a domain name registered with the DN server, a domain name server, all right? And the domain name points to the IP address. I'm hoping that makes sense. Uh, they like to ask you questions about that. Right, we've reached hosting. Do I need to do one more? Let's see. Um, yeah, let's finish this one. So, for example, when you visit a website, here's the story. You enter the URL which is the full address, okay, uh, GCS, gcsecs.org forward slash index, which is often the home page. Um, it's, it, it's usually forward slash index, the home page for the website. And notice that's different from the domain name, right? Forward slash index or forward slash home is the home page. Um, now, the domain name, so, so you type in this address, gcse.org index. What happens behind the scenes, you type that into your address bar in uh, Chrome, you press enter, and the domain name is looked up in DNS. So in the DNS system, it, it says, right, have we, got, have we got an IP address for gcsecs.org forward slash index, right? It has a look for it, and it finds it. It then returns that number, 192.64.8.3, whatever it is, and it sends that number back to your browser, and your browser then then accesses those resources directly. And all of that happens in a fraction of a second. So you're just typing in bbc.co.uk, 
your computer is pinging that address, is, ping, is pinging that URL to a, to a domain name server. The domain name server is going, yeah, the actual address is 192.6.4.8. It's pinging it back to your browser, and then your browser goes directly to that resource and opens it. Okay, And that all happens in a fraction of a second. It's quite an amazing system. It sounds really clunky, but given how popular the web is, it works, doesn't it? And it's scalable, which is what makes it so successful. Cloud storage is storing stuff on the internet, okay? Storing stuff online at a remote location using the internet. Um, and you've also got cloud software, which is software stored on the cloud and software executed from the cloud. I'm going to do cloud and then stop. Maybe ask you a question. The pros of cloud storage are, or using the cloud are, you can access it from any connected device. It's easy to increase storage. If you didn't have a cloud, you've got to go and buy a hard drive. So you don't need expensive hardware. They manage all the management for you. There's backup security and the software is automatically updated. On the negative, if you don't have an internet connection, you can't access anything. You're you are dependent on them for security and backups. It may be vulnerable to hackers. And, yet, and we're not always sure who owns the data, especially if your data is stored overseas. Um, you know, just the paranoia of dealing with uh, Chinese companies companies at the moment because the government's concerned about where data is stored and the so software may be expensive so I think that is pretty good let me ask you a question I'm not going to do that one today I'll come back to that next week so let me go down to ask you some questions and see if you know any of these doing a logical shift left does what to a binary number any idea you've got a choice does it divide or does it multiply? Any idea? Wow, the first in was Marco there. Uh, and it'll flash up on my screen in a second. And he has come in with, uh, Marco has come in with uh, multiply, which is B. Warrant has said B. Madcap said B. Hi, Daniel. Daniel said B as well. Well, let's see if you're right. The answer is, oh, yeah, Dan's coming up. Yeah, it is B. So I always think it's easy to remember because I think the king has the right to divide. That's how I remember it. And the other ones multiply. So that's my uh, that's, that's my way of remembering it. So what about this one? Building on your massive success there. What about doing a two-bit left logical shift? If it's right to divide, it's left to multiply. So we know it's got to be a multiply. What's it going to do? Is it going to divide it by two? Is it going to multiply it by two? Is it going to, well, any of those, you've got four options. What do you reckon? So we have got Marco, who says D, who got in a fraction of a second before Dan, who said D. And then we got Madcap, who said D. You guys are, you and someone else. And Om has gone, ah, good for you. Uh, vive la différence. It is, of course, that one. What about this one? Which answer has correctly applied a one-bit left logical shift to one zero 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 one one zero zero? What do you reckon? What is the answer here? What do we think, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, Om may have been right. Is it R? Is it repeatedly A? Or is it something else? What do we think? Which answer has correctly... Oh, look at Marco. So Dan got in first that time. He said B. Marco said B. God, you guys are quick. It's amazing. Uh, it's D. Let's jump on. What about this one here? Convert. Oh, this is hard. You haven't got time to do this. I'll do two more questions and I'll pack it in because I've done, I've done a 50 minutes and you lot uh, deserve to have a bit of a... Oh, that's going to be hard. Let's not do that. Uh, no, keep going. Uh, no, nor that one. We've just done this one. Let's just do something different. I've got more of these questions and we can shake a stick out. I'm done. We have done it. Okay. So listen, guys, that is really, really good. So I have got all the way through in networks to servers and I can finish this topic next week. And I think this, this topic gets trickier and trickier because it ends up dealing with layers and people find the notion of layers quite tricky to understand. So I will start with servers next week. I've done about four weeks of teaching there in 40 minutes. Guys, it's been an absolute privilege. Well done. We had 19 people in really good numbers, which is great. Thank you for giving up your time. Um, I'll put this online. I'll put some chapters in it. Um, I can send you some more information, and I'll do that over the next day or two, okay? And I will see you all in a week's time. Bye-bye, guys. Uh,
great for being uh, thank you for being here uh, well done uh, do you know what you are you are all uh, more than welcome um, more than welcome no problem at all it is a pleasure because uh, oh, I can't even spell welcome if you're here I'll do it and if it's helpful brilliant and also if I still can't spell welcome and if there's something I haven't covered or areas that you that you feel that you really need attention I can jump you're welcome on I can I can jump off piste you are welcome you are welcome and you are welcome and you are also welcome let me know what you're struggling with I know one of the areas a few of you are concerned about some of paper two doing paper two in this format isn't necessarily brilliant but I do intend getting on to that uh, at some point later on okay I'm trying to do it roughly half and half but either find me find me in school or email me and let me know if there's something that you really want to cover because I may as well do what's useful for you because I'm just here to help you guys see you tomorrow be good um, take care